King Philip um, was very young, from what I've read. Do, what was he in his 20s? I have no idea how old King Philip was when the war broke out. Um, it's said that uh, when his son was captured in 1676 during the war, he was estimated to be about nine years old. So therefore, I consider that, you know, Philip probably was in his 30s, likely. Um, I don't have the sense that he was an older man at all. Um, I don't know a lot of, I don't know with a lot of great confidence much about him, because basically everything that we know about him is filtered through time and the writings of English people who basically are trying to exonerate themselves and promote their own culture rather than objectively give a native point of view. Tell me something though, one thing I've read again and again, and I don't know if that means it's a fact or if it's just something that's been repeated. Um, um, I've read that one of the few things that we noticed. 186 is next. Where my heart is broken, now I am ready to die. I don't think that Philip actually was quoted as saying his heart was broken and he was ready to die. As I remember it, um, it seems that that was something that some other natives said to the English about him when his wife and son were captured. What happened to them? Apparently they were sold into slavery and there's a lot of debate about where they actually ended up. Not having been there, I don't know. You can probably tell me something, though, about Indian slavery. Um, how, was it something that happened just in this area, or were vast numbers of, of Native people either enslaved in this country or sent elsewhere? Slavery of Native peoples began in the f second voyage of Columbus, so it's that old. Um, New England native slavery seems to have started uh, in 1638, the year after the Pequot War, where a lot of the Pequot females and children were enslaved within the colony. Men and boys were generally shipped out of the colony to, out of New England, to um, Barbados, I believe. No, maybe not Barbados, maybe Bermuda or the Bahamas, I forget, one of those islands that begins with a B. And uh, they were exchanged for Africans that had been working on the sugar plantations there and had been used to English people and brought over to New England. So it was part of the link between the West Indies and Africa and New England. And uh, after well, during King Philip's War, almost immediately during King Philip's War, a group of native people, Wampanoag people, surrendered to the colony. They hadn't been in arms against the, the English, but this group of men, women, and children, I think it was about 120 of them, were sold because they hadn't warned the English that Philip was preparing a war. And so therefore deserved to be sold out of the country, except for maybe some few which probably were enslaved within the, co the colony. This happened to other groups. Some people, some English people objected to this, saying it would only prolong the war. If natives saw that any innocent natives would be sold, that would put them all on Philip's side, which was partially right, but they were ignored. So there was some humanitarian voice even amongst the warriors on the English side. The, uh, the natives that were captured during the war, most of the adults seen that they were sold out of the country to various ports. We don't know exactly where uh, any of them ended up, at least I'm not sure. There's some rumors and possibly some documentation somewhere. But I've also seen in colony records where apparently young people, children, were in, made as uh, indentured slaves, indentured servants, in the colony for a certain amount of years until they turned about 23 and then they would be freed. Uh, permanent bond slavery uh, did exist as well but was rarer I think, at least in the colony. Outside of the colony that's where most of the bond servants, the permanently uh, sold people 
who had no hope of freedom, they were generally sold out of the country to get rid of them. You know, it's interesting to me because everybody, I mean, uh, virtually everybody knows about the history of African-American enslavement. And the colony of Rhode Island actually was one of the biggest uh, slave trading places of selling natives out of the country and bringing Africans into the country in, to replace the natives. Because if you have a slave who's in his own territory, he can get away very easily. But if you, you bring in somebody that's foreign and doesn't know the country, where is he going to hide? So therefore, get the natives, particularly the men, out and bring in the Africans. And Newport was the biggest slave trading port on the East Coast and supplied slaves for all the other colonies. I never knew that. I never read that. Most people don't know it. People think of the North as being the home of abolition and anti-slavery, but the North had just a different type of slavery. In the North, native slaves and African slaves generally lived with the English family as opposed to on the southern plantations living apart from the family except for certain domestics. So therefore, native and African slaves in New England generally learned different types of trades and could get around very easily in English society. So therefore, they're not as visible historically as southern plantation slaves. But certainly there were slaves in New England that were native, not just New England native slaves, but uh, also natives from the West Indies brought in as slaves. I wanted to ask you finally, and I'm jumping around a bit, um, but one of the things that we're going to be doing in this show is uh, with about what that place looked like. Um, what was going on there when the colonists came over around 1621? Do you know? I have no knowledge, really, of what Montauk looked like. Um, for one thing, uh, Montauk is just one place on the peninsula. Uh, it's that Montauk, as far as I can understand it, means uh, the summit or the high place, and that refers to the hill uh, in Bristol, Rhode Island, uh, near where Philip was killed. But uh, there were a number of other spots on that place, on that peninsula, that was traditionally known as Kasumset Neck, and natives lived all over that peninsula, not just at that one little spot. Archaeology shows it. And I can't see that they would live at any one spot for too long because they would exhaust the fuel. And native people did move villages when fuel, good available firewood, was scarce. I don't know, but it possibly could have been every 10 years or so. So for several generations during the 1600s, uh, these villages, and they may have been several small villages rather than one big, huge one, that you know were like hamlets, part of the same community, but possibly all over the place. Uh, we know that some of them were up near uh, the Kikamuit River, uh, somewhere along the uh, Soams River, the Warren River, and other places. So it could be that native settlements, you know, were not, as some people envision, you know, b big, huge villages surrounded by cornfields. That n and these villages never moved. That's illogical. They did not. They did not move those. Uh, keep those kinds of situations. As a matter of fact, one of the questions they asked the English was about their coming over here was, why are you coming over? Is because you want wood. Because they knew that people moved settlements occasionally so that they would have plenty of wood. You know, they weren't nomadic, but they certainly were practical. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't really know what Montauk would have looked like at any period in time. What it looked like when Massasoit was alive in 1620 and what it looked like when Massasoit died around 1660 may have been, they may have moved in that time. They probably did. That's 40 years. That's a lot of picking up of firewood. And uh, Philip and Alexander and others, you know, they may have had several different villages in that territory. Okay, thanks.